Herbert Armstrong, born on May 13, 1869, at 23 Princess Square, Plymouth, came from a modest family background. The family later relocated to Edgehill, Liverpool. Admitted as a sizer to St. Catherine College, Cambridge, in 1887, he earned a BA degree in law and became a qualified solicitor in February of 1895. He further obtained an MA from St. Catharines in 1901. Commencing his legal practice in Liverpool, and later a Newtown Abbot, Armstrong successfully secured a position in Hay-on-Wye in 1906. In the subsequent year, he entered into matrimony with Catherine Mary Friend, and the couple had two daughters, Eleanor and Margaret, and a son, Pearson. The Armstrong family took residence in the distinguished Mayfield estate in the village of Cusop Dingle, near Hay, where Armstrong managed his law firm, Cheese and Armstrong. Known for his diligent work ethic, he ascended in the town's social circles, earning the role of clerk to the justices. Actively involved in the volunteer force, he achieved the rank of captain. When the First World War erupted in 1914, Armstrong, now referred to as Major Armstrong, was called up and ultimately attained the rank of Major in the Royal Engineers Territorial Force, serving in France from May to October 1918. Post-war, he continued to be addressed as Major Armstrong. In May of 1919, Catherine Armstrong's health began to decline, exhibiting symptoms that the local physician, Dr. Thomas Hinks, diagnosed as brachial neuritis. She seemingly recovered without the need for consultation with Hanks for over a year. However, by August of 1920, Mrs. Armstrong's physical and mental health deteriorated once more. Armstrong, deeply concerned, maintained close contact with Hanks, consulting with relatives and friends. Hanks observed signs of mental collapse linked to her illness. At the end of August, Mrs. Armstrong was admitted to Barnwood, a private mental asylum near Gloucester, exhibiting symptoms such as pyrexia, vomiting, heart murmurs, albumin in the urine, partial paralysis in the hands and feet, loss of muscle tone, and delusions. Mrs. Armstrong's condition improved during her stay at Barnwood, leading to her discharge on January 22, 1921. Unfortunately, her health deteriorated again shortly after returning home, and she passed away on February 22, 1921, at the age of 48. On the death certificate, Hanks, despite being puzzled by her symptoms, attributed her death to gastritis, aggravated by heart disease and nephritis. Throughout her illness, Armstrong displayed unwavering concern, sitting by her bedside in the evenings and leaving work early to be with her. While some authors assume that Armstrong's marriage failed due to Mrs. Armstrong's domineering attitude, the true nature of their relationship remains unclear. It was commonly believed that Mrs. Armstrong was an unpleasant woman who publicly mistreated her husband. Few attended her funeral, despite local newspaper descriptions of her as a popular hay lady. However, when separated from her husband due to hospital stays or wartime service, Mrs. Armstrong expressed a desire for the family to reunite. Regardless of the truth, Major Armstrong, having experienced the First World War, engaged in extramarital affairs and made advances toward local girls at dances and hay. On the day of Mrs. Armstrong's death, the servants closed all the curtains as a mark of respect, but Armstrong, upon returning home, promptly opened them again. Oswald Martin stood as Armstrong's sole competitor among solicitors in Hay. Both were engaged in representing conflicting parties in the sale of the Villanude estate, a transaction that carried the potential consequence of Armstrong's client facing a substantial loss, with Armstrong himself possibly having to pay a considerable sum to Martin's client. The intricacies of the deal remain unclear, with Martin suggesting concern about the titles. It seemed that the deposit entrusted to Armstrong for the sale had vanished. Despite Martin constantly pressing Armstrong about completing the transaction, Armstrong repeatedly postponed it, leading to its unresolved status at the time of Armstrong's trial. On October 26, 1921, Armstrong extended an invitation to Martin for a meeting at his residence. Expecting a discussion on the completion of the property sale, Martin found tea laid out with cakes and buttered scones. However, the conversation between the two men primarily revolved around mundane topics and office organization, despite the opportunity for Martin to address the pending property matters. Armstrong, expressing loneliness after his wife's death, casually handed a scone to Martin, saying, "Excuse fingers. After consuming the scone, Martin fell violently ill upon returning home. Martin's father-in-law, John Davies, a chemist in Hay, had previously sold arsenic to Armstrong. 
purportedly for dandelion control, though it was autumn with minimal dandelions in the Armstrong's garden. Suspecting foul play due to Martin's sudden illness, Davies became more alarmed when Martin mentioned the tea at Mayfield. Dr. Hinks, noting the similarities between Martin's symptoms and those of Catherine Armstrong, collaborated with Martin and Davies. Davies cautioned the Martins against accepting gifts from Armstrong. Subsequently, it was revealed that a few weeks before the tea party, an anonymous box of chocolates had been sent to the Martins, causing violent illness in Mrs. Martin's sister-in-law. Examination of the chocolates revealed a small nozzle-like hole in some. Dr. Hinks alerted the home office about his suspicions regarding Martin and later raised concerns about Mrs. Armstrong's death. Analysis confirmed the presence of arsenic in the chocolates and Martin's urine, prompting the home office to involve Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard proceeded cautiously to avoid tipping off Armstrong. He was arrested on December 31, 1921, charged with attempting to murder Oswald Martin. Maintaining his innocence, Armstrong was found with a packet of arsenic upon arrest. An additional arsenic was discovered in his home. The exhumation and examination of Mrs. Armstrong's body by home office pathologist Bernard Spilsbury, ten months after her death, revealed extensive arsenic poisoning. On January 19, 1922, Armstrong faced charges of willfully murdering his wife, maintaining his innocence with the repeated assertion, I repeat what I said before, I am absolutely innocent. The trial of Armstrong, accused of murdering his wife, commenced at Hereford before Mr. Justice Darling on April 3, 1922. Renowned criminal trial barrister Sir Henry Curtis Bennett led Armstrong's defense, generating immense public and media attention. The involvement of Armstrong's business rival and father-in-law among the individuals bringing charges to the police raised suspicions in some quarters with speculations that Armstrong might be a victim of framing. Despite prevailing beliefs in his potential acquittal, the prosecution presented a compelling case. Catherine Armstrong's body revealed extensive arsenic poisoning, and the quantity at the time of her death suggested even higher levels. Armstrong's significant purchase of arsenic added weight to the prosecution's argument. The defense faced the formidable task of convincing the jury that Mrs. Armstrong had taken her own life by leaving her bed, descending the stairs, and ingesting arsenic without detection, or that a substantial accidental dose had entered her system. All witnesses affirmed her near-paralyzed state towards the end. Dr. Bernard Spilsbury asserted that the fatal dose must have been ingested within 24 hours of death, while Dr. Hinks deemed it absolutely impossible for Mrs. Armstrong to have self-administered the arsenic. Despite the prevailing skepticism, the prosecution presented a robust case, leaving the defense with the challenging task of challenging established beliefs and presenting a plausible alternative scenario to the jury. Armstrong found himself compelled to clarify his practices regarding arsenic, specifically arsenic trioxide, during the trial. He asserted that his routine involved placing small amounts of arsenic in individual pouches, which he then dispensed onto the ground near areas prone to dandelion growth. However, his explanation faltered when a small pouch was discovered on his person during his December arrest, with no reasonable justification provided for carrying it, especially during that time of year. Under questioning by Mr. Justice Darling on this matter, Armstrong did not fare well. Post-trial, two potential motives surfaced for Catherine Armstrong's poisoning. First, Armstrong desired a different, more agreeable wife. Second, Catherine had drafted a will in 1917 bequeathing the majority of her estate to their children, excluding her husband. Armstrong presented a new will after her death, granting him control of the estate, but suspicions arose about its authenticity. Armstrong had been facing financial difficulties in his business even before the Villeneuve estate affair exacerbated his troubles. Despite the substantial evidence against Armstrong, it remained largely circumstantial. No one witnessed Major Armstrong administering poison, and Mrs. Armstrong had occasionally spoken of suicide. Some medicines contained arsenic, and numerous individuals had contact with her at Mayfield. The prosecution failed to establish how Armstrong, and only Armstrong, could have administered the poison. Regarding the Martin poisoning, Oswald Martin's death, aside from buying Armstrong some time, wouldn't have alleviated the Major's business woes. Armstrong never confessed and vehemently maintained his innocence until the end. On April 13, 1922, at Shire Hall, Hereford, he was found guilty of the murder of his wife. Mr. Justice Darley concurred with the jury's opinion, 
dismissing as absurd and unsupported by evidence the notion that Mrs. Armstrong had taken her own life. Subsequently, Armstrong received a death sentence. On May 16, 1922, the Court of Criminal Appeal rejected his appeal, leading to Armstrong's execution by hanging at Gloucester Prison on May 31, 1922. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing by clicking the red subscribe button below. And don't forget to ring that notification bell so you never miss an update. Your support means the world to us. Please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.